Well, welcome to the podcast. And again, I've got a very special guy. He is what you call a high performance coach from Rayleigh in the States. I think it's near North Carolina. He's an absolute legend in his area. He there, There's nothing this man can't do. And when you hear his story, you're going to go, wow, he's got that, but he achieved that. I mean, it's going to show you all that it doesn't matter what you want to do. If you want to do it, you're going to be able to do it. Coach Williams, how are you, mate? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Robert. Pleasure being here with you today. So I just want to explain to our listeners from all over the world, where are you? I'm in uh, actually about 30 minutes outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, a little small town called Siler City, North yeah. Carolina. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful day here. And did you did you grow up there? Actually, I grew up here in Siler City, North Carolina. Yeah. And uh, I when I, I went to school away from here, but I, I ended up coming back here yeah. um, for a little while. And uh, it is... In a very, very, very small town, like kind of a lot of people know each other. Yeah, um, nothing wrong little, with it. Yeah, it's just, it's a great place, you know, if you want to get away from it all. And, uh, you know, just kind of, especially if you're a person who's constantly in the public and in front of people. Yeah. This is a great way to kind of <laughs> uh, have your great little hideout, little getaway. <laughs> I saw in a documentary uh, the other month on George Michael. Mm-hmm. And when he was living in London, he they said to him, you know, he could have had anything he wanted. In the end, he moved to a small town on the edge of London in a normal house. And they said, why? And he said, because I just wanted to get away from everybody. Mm-hmm. And he lived a normal life as much as someone of, as, as high profile as him. So you enjoyed school? Yeah, I, actually, it was pretty amazing. Actually, when I was younger... And I um, went to school. Hmm. Uh, I I um, I had the opportunity to actually go to Tennessee out in Knoxville, and um, you know I I studied out there for a little while, and but I didn't get the opportunity to finish at that period of time. Out of state tuition, a lot of other things that were going on. Yeah. Um, however, what I was able, I when I was positioned, I actually went back to school as an adult. And um, completed several degrees. I, I, I think I became really fascinated with the whole concept of learning and achieving and uh, went back to school, got my associates, got my bachelor's, got my master's. And I'm currently um, doing a dissertation to receive my doctorate degree um, in management and organizational leadership. Wow. So, yeah, it is it has been a. a an amazing journey, and I find that going to back to school as a uh, an adult learner, you have so much more focus. You know, when you're yeah. when you're going to school as a teenager, it's kind of like you, your first time out. You know, no 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 restrictions, no rules, no any of that. <laughs> and the social life's like, more important than the study life. But when you when you go back as an adult, and especially having to do it online. Because I think the the online learning model presented a significant amount of challenges for a mm. lot of people. Uh, but w- once you're once you're having to learn online and you're not sitting in an environment with your instructor and you're having to do things um, with a virtual instructor and mm. uh, schedule any kind of virtual meets or even working with a team online, you gain a lot. And uh, that has proven to be extremely valuable. Over the last two to three years, especially, yeah. you know, in the pandemic and um, even in the the age of what we now call the, um, the you know, where, where people, this massive exodus from the marketplace, um, people have, you know, made the decision that they, they no longer wanted to work in organizations or, you know, at best, they wanted to work from home. So, yeah. you know, that that piece is created a significant amount of uh adaptability if you will and yeah. I'm, i've been very well versed in that in my life well just gonna pull you up on that one adaptability i was reading up and i'm gonna look this down side because i don't like to get it right you were diagnosed with incomplete paraplegia yeah when did that happen yeah. and 
How did you handle it? So I had, uh, I was, I was working for a financial institution yeah. at the time. And my main, my routine was get up, go to the gym. I'd be there at five, six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I would get my workout in before I started my day. Well, I noticed that uh, I started limping and it became a very noticeable limp. And I was saying, you know what? Um, something doesn't feel right. Maybe yeah. I pulled a muscle or something in my groin or, and uh, I want to go to get that checked out. So I went to the emergency room. To go get it checked out. They ran several tests and, you know, I, I was thinking this was going to be pretty easy, but they kept running tests and all of a sudden, um, a quick in and out became a three and four hour testing. Wow. Period. And then they told me, Mr. Williams, you have, you have cyst on your spine and, uh, we need to operate immediately. If one of these cysts burst, it could kill you. And so all of a sudden, everything elevated to level 10. How old were you then? Quickly. I was 26, 27 years old. Wow. 27 years old. Yeah. And um, we did the surgery. And after that, I basically was walking like within a matter of a few days. Hmm. The challenge was I did not rehabilitate properly. Yeah. Um, the, the physical rehabilitation, I did not rehabilitate properly. And as a result, um, the, 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 they removed the cyst off my spine, but one sat inside the internal spinal column yeah. and they couldn't remove it. If they would have, they would have ruptured my entire spine. Yeah. So they just put a shunt in it to drain it. Um, about a year or so after the surgery, that, shunt came out it completely came out and it started impacting my physical mm. health my physiology and so <clears throat> my i went back to the surgeon to say you know something doesn't feel right and he was like your whole gait is off and uh i went and looked and said the shit the, sh the shunt has come out of the the cyst and we need to um replace it we need to put it back in. So that meant another back surgery. Yeah. So round two, I'm thinking, well, we, we did well on the first one. I was back up and walking shortly after less reservations, less than what we have to do mm. to get it correct. Well, after the second surgery, they asked me to move my legs and I couldn't do it. Then they asked me to wiggle my toes and I couldn't do it. And they were trying to figure out why I couldn't do it. And um, they, they diagnosed me first all. Um, quadriplegic. And then I raised my hands and they were like, well, no, you're clearly not quadriplegic. And then they diagnosed me paraplegic, but they noticed that I could move my legs some. And so then they diagnosed me incomplete paraplegic. Uh, and I wish I could say that was the brunt of it. However, in the operating room, I contracted MRSA, the most deadly staph infection. Oh, um, yeah, yes, yeah out there and so uh, i contracted that in the operating room and the incomplete paraplegia was a challenge within itself but the MRSA on top of it led to a life like you know it, it was it was like having two things hit you at one time and you're constantly trying to d navigate mm. and adaptability as we mentioned before became the key to this, not only, you know, um, survival, but how to navigate life. And so I went through several episodes where I was, I, I was hospitalized in long-term care. I've been in ICU, CCU. I've stayed in acute care facilities. I've stayed in even nursing homes. I, I, I actually lived in a nursing home for a period of time. Yeah. And we did that for about seven years about seven years in and out of these facilities. And um, I actually started my business in the hospital. So I'll get I'll my just hospital to, bed. It's an amazing story. And you do hear people that get those challenges. And they make a choice one way or the other. You have the, some that go down the pity party. I mean, I know the grieving side of it, that you everyone goes through it at, at one stage or another. 
but some go down and stay there, blame the world, don't achieve anything in life, don't look, don't use what's happened to them to help others. You chose, and then I mean that's 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 where it comes down to. You chose the opposite. Yeah, you had a rough trot, and you know, no one would ever would would ever be in your shoes. But you just said you started a business. So you've had to actually go, well, hang on a minute, my mindset, I'm going to make something of this. You are very successful these days. What happened for you to make that decision? Well, you know, I'm going to turn this around and I'm going to make the most of this. I'm going to start a business. Did one thing well, happen? I can tell Was you it this. Faith? Was it a, just a, a moment watching something on television? Because it was I easy can tell to do the other. This. Yeah, the 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 uh, the thing that was presented to me um, was that the the doctors had gotten to the point where they told me there was there was nothing else they could do. Yeah, there was no more surgeries to be had. Um, I ran out of resources. There was no more skin grafts, no more muscle grafts they could do. Yeah, and so that was like that's it. And like the only way, the only option for you is you got to heal from the inside out. Well, that all came on the 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 um. The, the 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 after that 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 all came on the uh the brink of me hearing mr williams if you don't do something you you could be dead in 10 days jeez so to compound or properly frame this mm. i was working with the in a 10 day window for life i had been given a 10 day life sentence and so it was at that point, um, to speak about what you were sharing, that I had to say, you know what? You can make an impact or you can make an excuse, hmm. but you can't do both. And so I had come to the resolve that if I'm going out, I want to leave it all on the table. <laughs> Good on you. I'm going if I'm if I'm going if I'm going to go out I'm going to leave it all on the table I'm going to play full out give it everything I got and though they told me I had ten days to live I I said you know what I'm I'm not going to receive that I'm going to make a decision I'm you know I I believe I subscribe to a higher power yeah and I'm like you you may have a degree that that tells me. <laughs> what the condition looks like, but I subscribe to a higher power that says, you know, he controls a life. So with that being the case, I just put my faith in action. And by making the decision not to focus on the life sentence, I just started focusing on making an impact. And so I started an online radio show and I basically poured into people everything I needed to hear. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to make an impact on this world. And I was relentless at going online, creating shows, yep. motivational messages, message to encourage people, inspire and light. I wanted so I wanted to have so many things out there. So what do the doctors people, say now happened? when they see you and they go, well, you're supposed to be dead? <laughs> it, it, it literally is a miracle. It's a miracle, you know, I, that, that, you know, I, and I go and I look and I'm like, well, you know, sometimes you're, 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 you're right or, or you're wrong. And sometimes you're really wrong. And so it, it just gives, it gives, it speaks to the power of faith, but it also speaks to the power of, um, resilience mm. within an individual. And that, you know, that this, that determination to like, I'm going to spend the rest of my days pouring into others. And as I did that, my life, I went from 10 days to live. I was from that 10 day life sentence to a life, a full life. Yeah. There things that took place for me, I, I began to experience life. So I went from 10 days to live to 10 days to life. Awesome. And so I, it wasn't the 10 days was not about setting me up to expire. The 10 days was about setting me up to make impact. It gave me I, I was more driven in that period of time 
And one guy called in and asked and said, um, what are your fees for coaching? I didn't even have a coaching business at that time, but he asked me and I was always taught say yes, then go figure it out. A hundred percent. And I started my business from a bed bound condition in the hospital. And I said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to coach this guy. I'm going to do it. And so it started there as I began to progress and heal. You know, I, I, I beat the, the expiration date and before I knew it, it was 30 days and I was, you know, I was so out of mind with it. I wasn't even thinking about the 10 days anymore. I looked up 30 days later. I was like, oh, I should have been dead 20 days ago. And, and I just kept going. And, and before I knew it, I looked up, it was a year later and then it was five years later and then it was 10 years later and it was 15 and then it was 20. And, you know, here I am now, basically 22 years. And I, I have, I'm, I'm still going, life is still going. Business is still growing. I've achieved more. I've done more from this state than I ever did before this condition came into life. So I have to ask the question, was it that th this adversity became my biggest asset because it gave me something in life, a platform, if you will that caused me to see life through a different lens and provide something extremely valuable to other people. So what do you do when you're a very successful business and personal coach now, and you're known for not pulling punches, as we say in Australia, what do you do when a business person looks at you and says, pandemic, it's ruined my business, it's ruined my life, you know, with that down on the out thing, and you're looking at them, and they don't know your story but you know your journey. What do you say to someone like that now? Because there's not a lot of resilience out there. There's not a lot of businesses. That they're choosing just to shut because they say it's all too hard. How do you approach those people? How do you not shake them and go wake up to yourself? Well, my, my, I have a very much, a very no BS approach. Yes. I love it. So working with clients. And so, I'm very much, you know, you can make an impact or you can make an excuse, yeah. but you can't do both. You have to decide what what are you here to do? Are you here to make an impact? Or are you here to make an excuse? And I'm here to help you make that decision. Um, and so I'm like, listen, you you can you can you can tell me that you're challenged. You you can do all of that, but you, let me tell you what you're not gonna do. You're not going to come in here and make a thousand excuses. You're not going to come in here and, 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 and live in your story. You're not going to bring me in it. You know, we're going to like, if we're going to work together, then you're going to have to make a decision to put it all on the line. You have to put it all on the line and, and let's see what comes from it. Like, but you have to kind of leave the excuses on the outside because that doesn't work. My whole, coaching environment is a no BS zone. So like we, we, you know, you keep those excuses on the outside because you, you'll get toasted here in this environment with that. I, I'm, I'm a person who's well-versed in knowing what it's like to have it all on the line <laughs> and, and, and to do. And so, uh, you, you know, you can take it to somebody who doesn't understand that, but with me, no. Can so I'm, I'm very, I'm very, I'm, I'm not brash. But at the same time, I'm very, listen, we, we can't, in, especially in today's time where so much is on the line, mm. we can't afford to, to be pampered, so to say, in yeah. business anymore. I, like we, we've got to recognize the seriousness of the issue and address it for what it is, because these are very trying times. And like we have to be able to recognize that you have to approach business. This is not for the faint of heart. No. This is not for those who, you know, um, if, if you want to, if you want a glorified hobby, do that, but don't, don't mask it as a business and do that. Like it, it business is not for the faint of heart. No. And you so talk, if you, you want talk to about do that. Resilience a lot. <clears throat> Can resilience be taught or is resilience in everybody just has to be brought out? It has to be activated. I believe wholeheartedly that resilience is inherent. Yeah. 
it is very much inherent, um, but it's not always activated. And so there are things in life, you know, most people talk about the game of surviving hmm. and the importance of survival. There is no survival without resilience. There is no survival. If you don't build their resilience, you can't survive. And so we all have it in us. It just wasn't designed to be made a quality of life. Survival is no way to live. No. Nah. Um, no, it, you know, it is a great tool. It is a great skill set to have activated, but it is no way to live. And so, but it's hard for to get people to understand that unless you have had scenarios where you were being told you had 10 days to live or mm. you were living in a unit where people were dying to the left and right of you every 15 minutes until you've been in that situation. You really don't understand that survival is no way to live in, in your speeches and in your coaching, you talk about something that you label as leverage in mm. business. What is that in your mind when it comes to business and in life? So leverage is leverage is defined as the use of something for maximum advantage. Yeah. And when I work with businesses and we, I talk about leverage, they will say, oh, I have leverage in my business. And I'm always saying, if you're not able to get what you need out of the business to create the freedom, the flexibility, hmm. the fortune that you want, then your leverage is limited. Hmm. Leverage by definition is something to be used for, for maximum advantage. It allows you to achieve far beyond what you could do on your own. You get much more um, out of your efforts. It's like little effort, maximum output. And so leverage is the thing that helped me in life because I was in a situation where I was bed bound. I couldn't get out and do other things. I, I was limited to four walls. Yeah. But from that four walls, I touched the world. Four walls, and I did leadership training in uh, for a Fortune 50 company. Uh, I did uh, sales training for uh, a, a client who had businesses in nine different countries. I did sales training from a bedbound condition. I've coached, I've trained professionals, leaders, CEOs, entrepreneurs, managers, all from a bed bound condition. I did it all and never, never once made it about my condition. Never once did that. I just stepped into my value and brought what I brought to it. And then they were amazed when they found out that I was in a bed bound condition. And uh, it, it really, it really got people to say one question. What's my excuse? This guy, he's learned how to build a successful, sustainable six-figure business, a high-level six-figure business, uh, what's my excuse? If this guy can build something this, this significant and grow this from his condition, what's my excuse? And so I kind of allow my situation to speak for itself. And my resilience that I approach business with is the thing that inspires and causes people to say, you know what, um, it's not so much that I teach something different. There's a lot of people out there to teach business growth. There's a lot of people out there that teaches uh, sales and things of that nature. It's just that my information has something to it, adds something yes. to the equation that you don't get with everybody else. I, I have that when it's all on the line dynamic in my business. I have the perspective of when time is running out or you feel that, you know what, if I don't do something in my business, you know, I'm going to be out of business in 30 days. I'm going to be out of business in six months if I don't change something. If things don't turn around quickly, I'm going to be, you know, there will be no more business. Like there was going to be no more life for me. Mm. You know, so I bring that element to the equation. Like, man, if we don't do something now, something dramatic is going to happen and it's really going to set us back. So I bring that element to the business. When you speak to a lot of business people today, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is staff, especially the young 20-year-olds 
as we as in Australia and a lot of places we call them snowflakes. As soon as it gets a bit warm, they melt. They don't have a lot of resilience. They don't have they don't know leverage. As soon as someone in their mind is critical of them or says they're doing something wrong, they run off to HR or they run and complain or they quit. And so most businesses are now starting to hire older people because they have resilience. They know how to take criticism. How, as a business person, do we get through to the younger generation? Then when someone says you've done it wrong, it's not personal, it's business. How do do you change it? Because these young ones coming through, and I see it personally, they have, I'll be honest with you, no resilience. They they have uh, cotton wool. And they do yeah, struggle it, yet, it, yeah, so, you know. But, you know, and, and much of that, I have to credit to us. Yes. Because as 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 um, adults, we, we had to weather a lot of trying times and things yeah. of that nature. And many of us, I'm not saying all of us, but many of us grew up with the concept that I'm going to make sure my kids never had to go through what I went through. True. We're constantly trying to pad them from things that we didn't go through. That's why you see um, participation awards in sports mm. as children. When we grew up, it's like you won or you lost, and you didn't get a trophy for participating. That's life. You got a trophy because you won. Today, everybody gets a trophy. Today, win or lose, everybody gets it. And so there is nothing there that says you have to like earn this you know like it this this is not something that's just given to you because you know you are who you're no this is that if you get it you there's some equity in it for you we grew up that way okay i i understand that model this generation not so much because we stripped them basically from everything that we that made us great, we stripped them from all of that. We know what it's like to like, you know what, man, I was on the fence. I didn't have this. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I had, you know, I had to figure it out. I had to do something. We, we came from a generation that didn't mind us crashing and burning. Hmm. Today, it's not that way. It's not that way. We do everything we can to make sure people fall softly. And the biggest thing that helped me in life was crashing and burning. When I was on the, 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 when I was lying there burning, I had to make a decision. I had to do something different. Mm. I had, I had to pick up, you know, nobody could do this for me. The doctor said there was nothing else we could do. I couldn't rely on anything else. And that's when I heard spoken clearly to me, something in your life could be leveraged to create something you want. And that put me on this path to understand leverage because I, there were certain things I couldn't do, but I learned how to use leverage in life, leverage in business, leverage in things of that nature to ultimately take care of the things that I wanted to do and succeed far beyond anything I could have ever imagined or done. And leverage it helped me to do that. If you look back now at everything you've been through and your going down the street and you come across a 20-year-old self of you and you know what's ahead, what would you say to the 20-year-old coach? One I coach Williams thing, to another coach Williams. Well, I would, I, I would say just keep showing up. Mm. I would say, and, and there's a lot of people, they will try like, oh, this is coming down the road. That's coming down the road. No. You're gonna there, there'll be things in life. Mm-hmm. They're gonna be, they're gonna be some ama- they're gonna be some amazing things that you're gonna experience in life. That's gonna be the norm. Don't worry about that. What I want you to prepare for are those few trying tests that you're going to face because they're gonna make more impact on your life. Then the house you buy, then the car you buy, then the money you yeah. make. It's going to be those few, the few 
moments that you spend with adversity, the few moments that you spend fighting for your life the way you want it, that are going to make the biggest difference in your journey. Just be mindful of how you treat adversity. Be mindful how you handle adversity. Um, Napoleon Hill said in Think and Grow Rich, every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. It does. Don't dodge adversity. Dance with it. Learn how to dance with it. That would be the most priceless thing I could tell a 20-year-old version, coach, um, a 20-year-old coach uh, version of myself mm. is don't dodge adversity. Learn how to dance with it. If you learn how to dance with it, it has an amazing gift to give you. It, I know Joseph McLennan, uh, Tony Robbins, a lot of them have a very similar outlook on life. And, and it's true. It doesn't matter how you package it. Whatever you just said is true. If you look at a business now and someone comes into you and they're just on the brink, we're coming out of the pandemic, whatever, we don't know what the new norm is going to be. Nobody does. We're going to, I think this, we're still going to go through waves and all things are going to happen. And governments are going to make their decisions. But ultimately, it comes down to us. What would you say to someone who is traveling really well in their business but needs to take it to the next level? Needs to, to hit that top gear and they're stuck. If you looked them in the eye, what would you say to them? What would you, the first thing you get them to do? Well, the first thing that I would ask them is that, well, I mean, it's a serious kind of a question, but literally what's working, what's not working, mm. what would you like to be working? Mm. And once I got that answer, my question would be, so why do you think it's not working? Because what I've learned is in life, in business, especially in business. The most one of the most valuable tools we have is perspective. Yeah. What perspective helps us more than 98% of the things that we're taught in business. And having gone to school for business, having gone you know, and learn so much, even from experience. What I have learned is the most valuable asset that an entrepreneur, a business owner has in his tools box is his perspective. It's never what we think it is. It's really about how we're looking at it. People say, I got growth challenges. You don't have growth challenges. You have perspective challenges. Very, very good. You, you don't have money problems. You have perspective problems concerning money. It's how you look at it. It's how you think about it. If you begin to evaluate your perspective of what you're dealing with and what you're going through, you will find out the thing that's warped is not what you think it is. What's warped is what's going on within. And if you learn how to change that, it can impact. It can remove limitations. It will turn impossibilities into inevitabilities. It will turn your adversity into your greatest asset. It will create the predictable revenue that you want. It will give you the ability to maximize profitability and scale with effortless excellence. You'll do it, but it all begins with perspective. So in saying in perspective in that, What's the future for Coach Williams? What's your next big oh, challenge? So, so for for me, um, I, I am my my thing is literally I have uh, th this, just seeing how this whole piece goes with my book that's being released yeah. in the latter part of the year, um, and getting out and, and speaking more, finishing this dissertation. Yeah, because I, I'm really ready to get done with that. Like it, it becomes a point of time where it's like, OK, enough already <laughs> and get that over with. But it's it, for me, the future is all about 
teaching and demonstrating the power of possibilities. I, I think the, the thing that separates the icons, the iconic leaders in business and whatever that we see, and those who are um, less than iconic, is that every one of them operated in the power of possibilities. Yeah. I remember Henry Ford said, if I would have gave people what they asked for, then I would have created a buggy and a wagon. I'd, I'd have just had a, a much more souped up horse and buggy. Mm. It was the power of possibilities. All great inventions, all the, the, the great um, disruptions and things in life come from the power of possibilities. And even those things that challenge us um, so significantly in life can all be contributed to something that drove us to think about what we're looking at differently. That the whole point of coming against something where all of a sudden what used to work no longer works, you have to understand what it's trying to teach you. It's trying to tell you that the way that you're going is no longer serving you. And and rather than, you know, we're so I need to overcome the obstacle. I need I need to remove the obstacle. Remove the, I don't want any I don't want to go through anything. Well, you know what? You you, you want to be weak. You want to be weak because the only way you really gain this toughness and the hardening to difficulties is through being challenged. And I am so convinced of that. I'm so convinced of that, Robert, that I tell people, I don't even trust you unless you walk with a limp. <laughs> like I, I for coaches, this like they tell, oh, I you know, I started my business two years ago and I'm doing a million plus now and all of that. I'm like, okay. Thank you, but no thank you. Mm. I I don't I want to learn from somebody who has the ability to teach me how to dodge the pitfalls. If you if if all you want to teach me is the upside, but you can't teach me the pitfalls. If you can't teach me how to dodge the pitfalls and how yeah. to come from rise from the pitfalls. If you can't do I don't I don't even trust it. So like it, it, I am just at that place. I just what we call here in the states, I'm just built different. You know, like I, 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 I don't want something this flashy and cute. All I want something that will last. When you have a tremendous storm, the flashy and cute fades. The flashy and cute gets destroyed. What lasts? The durable things in life. And so, when life hits you, and it will hit you, there will be something that comes at some phase in life that will hit you and literally knock you to your knees and make you feel paralyzed in your potential. The question becomes, what do you do in life when you're faced with no other alternative than to journey the dark path of change? Mm. How do you do that? And if you don't, if you don't have any experience in that area, I don't really care. You know, you make a billion out that. No. Do you know how to navigate the dark path of change? Because Man. what I'm sure of is that the dark path of change is in my future someplace. It is there. And I know you're not talking about when your wife's got the cranks with you and how you navigate out of the back of the house so she can't find you for <laughs> at least 10 minutes. Exactly. Oh, he's got a big smile no. on his face for those who aren't seeing the uh, video of this. So he can relate to it like all us good husbands. Quick one before we wind up. If I gave you your favourite restaurant in Raleigh and you could have three people sit at the table, who are you going to invite? You know? I think it would be Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. He understood it, Bercy. I love it when when the people who can't see this, when they don't know this question's coming and you can see in their eyes it's ticking away. Who who am I going to invite? And people either pick people because they think they're the type of person I want to hear or they pick the person, two or three people, that really mean something to them or they want to learn something or who are 
polar opposites of who they are. So the tick is on you if you've got phone a friend. I, I would I would 50. say I, I'd take I'd invite him. Which one that? I, I would also I would invite Franklin yep. to Roosevelt. I would invite I would invite um and I'm I'm trying to think of her name right there. Madam CJ Walker. Mm -hmm. Who's she? She was the first black millionaire in the okay. United States of America. Yeah. Fantastic. Um and I would invite George Washington Carver. Yeah. A lot of history there. A man who created more he invented he cre he's responsible for more inventions and creations from the peanut than it. every one of these individuals experienced great adversity yeah but they all became leaders in their field yeah. and they led with adversity they led with something it's like anybody can lead like when you're on top of your game and nothing is going wrong and uh, everything is perfect and everything seems like it's in place and you know you don't have any challenges and every day is a sunny day and everything is fantastic we call that an illusion um business is a delicate balance between chaos and creativity like it's how do you navigate chaos mm. how, how do you because it's it's going to be chaotic but it isn't chaos and then fun. there's the it, it, it that's the point but so many people are like oh i don't want any of that you know just <laughs> no. I, I, I don't want that i don't want to deal with that just just get that away just leave that away it's like oh no you know and that's why they that's why they gravitate to jobs that's why yeah. they do that because you know we need somebody to Tell us when to get up in the morning and what time we can go home in the evening and how many times a month we can get paid and uh, make us call in and ask when we can take off for work and all that. We, we need that structure. Will you please pay my taxes for me? Um, I, they, 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 they get into that where entrepreneurship is like, you know what? You can have a client and sign a $100,000 deal. And all of a sudden they say, you know what? We're not going to pay you. Mm, true. Now what? Now what? Yeah, true. How do you deal with that? You know, that's the chaos of it all. I mean, you and it's constant, it's constant, constant things that are going on. But then you got this other side where you have to, you know, be exceptionally creative and be in harmony with that creative ability, that ability, like you talked about resilience. Um, people say, I tried this and it didn't work. I'm like, well, how many people did you talk to? Well, I, I spoke to five people and they said, I'm like, oh my gosh, five people? Really? There's like 8, million pe 8 billion people on earth and you talk to five people and now all of a sudden it doesn't work. Mm, true. Um, you know, so, so that is, it's that kind of thing. It's like, can you, can you take a hundred no's? If you get a hundred no's, then yeah, that thing doesn't work. But People are just again. It's that it's that piece that adds to everything. So I I would love to hear from them because they know what adversity looks like. Mm -hmm. They know exactly what it's like to journey the dark path of change, and they know how to handle the chaos, and they know how to be creative. And 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 those individuals, not necessarily um, maybe the top the top three people that most people would choose. But I'm looking at it from the standpoint of I want you to teach me how you navigated the dark path of change. And yet you became successful in spite of or with adversity, not thriving, overcoming adversity. But how do you thrive with adversity? How do you thrive while being while having a thorn? How do you do that? And so that's important to me. If people want to catch up with you, get a bit of your very, very good coaching on adversity, resilience, and leverage. Where do they find Coach Williams? Well, I can be reached on LinkedIn, uh, and I'm actually identified as Coach A.M. Williams. 
on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. You can coach AM Williams fan page. Yep. You can follow me there. I have a great fireside chats and social media. So, you know, people can communicate. You know, I share things, provide something special for those who follow. But if they want to get, you know, they want to mm. find out more about my business, they can go to coachamwilliams.com. Yep. Coachamwilliams.com and find out more about our services and things. Mate, it's We'd been love absolutely to connect. brilliant talking to you. You've got a fantastic story. And uh, I think people need to, if they're really serious about being successful in life or business, they need to look you up, have a chat. And uh, because you know what? we got no excuses listening to what you went through. Thank you so much for being on the show. Pleasure. Pleasure being with you. And at the, we say at the end of every one of our podcasts, except for our last one where we did had a bit of fun, have a groovy day. <laughs>